with no further ado, I would now like to get to the meat of the webinar and invite two of my colleagues up who have been key architects of this product. Mark Lukowski is a VP of Engineering in our Application Platform Group and his colleague Derek Collison is CTO and Chief Architect for Application Platform. As I mentioned, both these gentlemen have had very distinguished careers before. Uh, Mark played a key role in the evolution of Microsoft technology, Derek at TIBCO, and then they both had a number of years real hardcore experience in the, working in the cloud at Google. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. So today we're going to uh, go into Cloud Foundry in, in some detail, invite some guys up on stage to you know, show how they use the system, what they find is, is value in the system, and just you know, talk about how we put it together and how we built it. There's three basic areas that we're going we're gonna to walk through uh, through this web, webcast. We're going to talk about frameworks, runtimes, and languages, one axis of the triangle, and, and what we're doing there. Uh, application services, how you extend the cloud with new capabilities, and then clouds themselves. So, you know, wh where, where you're going to run your software. When Rod talks about the right to move from point A to point B, today a lot of people associate cloud with, well, there's this Amazon thing and I can move from the East Coast zone to the West Coast zone. We're talking about something much more profound, like sometimes that cloud should be on your laptop, maybe if you're a developer developing cloud software. Can you develop while you're on a beach in Hawaii or on the airplane at, at 20,000 feet or whatever? Um, what if you need your cloud inside the firewall in, in, in your enterprise? Can you move your app from the enterprise to the public cloud to your laptop and you have that kind of mobility? So those are some of the characteristics of the system that, that we're putting together. Um, you know, while we get into the frameworks, I think, Derek, you have some, some uh, comments on frameworks and how do you pick the right framework? You know, should it be Java? Should it be PHP? You know, what's really going on in the framework space that we tried to address? Well, Rod alluded to it earlier that, um, you know, there's been an evolution of frameworks and an explosion of frameworks today that we haven't seen probably in about 15 years. And, and the short answer is, as Mark and I and others on the team discussed early on, is we can't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have to build a platform for the future. And that means that as new frameworks come online, for example, like Node.js with Ryan, we need to support that. We need to embrace the openness of the platform itself as frameworks come on. At the same time, though, as enterprises have embraced Spring, we have lots of customers that actually use Spring extensively, both of those need to feel the same to the developers that are actually using the system. And so that was a key design point of what we were trying to do. Yeah, I guess it, it's, it's almost like that is one of the key extensibility points in our platform as a service. There's a lot of platform as a service that, you know, they're a single, they're a single language, single framework. So it's very easy in that environment to fall into the, you know, rapid, everything you do around this one framework and pretty soon when the next framework comes along, you, you, can't, you can't adapt. Even the micro frameworks, like in the Python space, there's, you know, there's Python in the core runtimes and then a lot of different frameworks around that. If you choose the wrong framework out of the gate, the world can pass you by. So from an extensibility standpoint, our system is built so that a framework really is just a module in the system that says, yeah, I know how to do Rails, and another piece of code says, I know everything about Node, and somebody else knows everything about Java. That lets us take the next framework by just saying, we just have to build that one module that says, I know the ins and outs of what it takes to take this framework and, and cloudize it so that we can run it in this, in this environment. Right, and to Mark's point, what, what we do internally is, is that once the actual system is trying to run apps, every single app looks exactly the same. There's a start button and a stop button, and what Mark was alluding to is, is that on the front end, and with some help from the developer, as you'll see, we can say, oh, this is a Spring application, this is a Ruby on Rails application, but the system's flexible enough that it actually just has a start and a stop button for whatever app you throw at it. And the cool thing about frameworks is that there's not an overwhelming number of frameworks that we have have to deal with. So out of the gate, we feel pretty good by saying, you know, we've attacked Spring, uh, Rails, and Node. And we'll go into that in detail. But, you know, that spectrum has, you know, the conservative safe choice in, in Java. You can't go wrong if you're on Spring, 
Rails used to be way out there, but now it's, it's very credible in, in the enterprise, very credible in certain environments. So it's kind of a little bit bleeding edge, but not too way out there. And then we have Node, the up and coming platform that's way out there. So I think that we have a nice spectrum. In the area of services, there's an insane amount of diversity. You know, there's, there used to be, oh, you know, what's your relational database? Is it Oracle, Postgres, or MySQL? Now it's, oh, you're still using SQL statements. Well, you should try our document store, our key value store. So there's so much diversity there that you're stuck in this world where if you're a developer and you want to try one of these new things, what, what do you try? How do you try? How do you dip your toes in the world and you know, try, play around with the service, form your own opinion, and give it a test drive. So yeah. one of the, the interesting things that uh, the team discussed early on is, is if we actually achieve our goal, and one of those goals, as Rod alluded to, is simplicity. If we achieve this goal, such as these services and this ecosystem is prevalent throughout, meaning that you can run it in any type of target cloud system, and even on your laptop, and all the heavy lifting for a service is already done. It's done by us. It's just available to you as a developer. So if you can crack open your laptop and all of a sudden you can say, wow, I want to give this service a try. It's automatically available. I just have to bind it to my app. What would that do? And we believe that there's going to be a transition, or we hope there will be a transition in terms of how developers actually use these services and consume them when the friction to getting them up and running is taken away. Yeah, I, without a doubt. I mean, you know, I spent a long time at Microsoft. I invented DLL Hell at Microsoft. And, and one of the things that I learned going through that era is that I hate installing software on my machine because every time I hit setup, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to get after that. Is the system going to work or not work? So for me, I like using these services in the cloud because I don't have to corrupt my machine. All I need is an editor and the command to push, push to the cloud. And I'll use these services out there. I mean, even, even you know, Mongo and Redis are insanely easy to pull down and configure and run on your Mac. I still won't use them on my local machine. I'd rather use them in the cloud than locally. Yeah, we had an interesting inflection point about, uh, I guess it was about six months ago in, in developing the system where Mark was having an issue and I said, well, does it run locally? And he goes, I don't know. And so he actually automatically transitioned from he never runs anything locally. And I think that's testament, and you guys will see this shortly, of you know, these systems can feel as light as developing locally. And uh, so that's an interesting thing. But that gets us to clouds. I mean, where, where, which, which cloud are we talking about? What cloud are we, are we using? You know, we had to bring up a cloud to build this cloud software. And you don't just you know, talk to your ops team and say, hey, would you power on a cloud for us? So our cloud started on our laptops. And then our clouds evolved into, well, hey, there's a couple of machines in the corner. Let's throw vSphere on it and throw some VMs on it. And now we have a cloud there. And then we bumped into, a, hey, let's go throw this on, on Amazon for something, because we're running out of gas on those three servers. And, and we didn't have a, a connection to Terramark yet. And our, yeah, we, our V Cloud yeah. partners and things like that in terms of saying, hey, we, can you give us about you know, so many machines? And they said, sure. And so the interesting thing that Mark's alluding to is, is whatever we throw at it, we want it to stick. It's the spaghetti on the wall thing. And uh, we believe that we've actually got a good first pass of what that means, no pun intended. Um, and you'll see that also in the demos. Yeah, I think Derek will show you that in the demos, how because we grew up in a multi-cloud environment, Changing clouds is as simple as one command line switch. You basically set your cloud target and away you go. It's like setting an environment variable and that says which cloud you're on. So that's pretty nice. So